Welcome to A Reason for Hope. My name is Adrian, and I am very excited to be in studio with one of our pastors here at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson, Arizona, Sean Richards. Good to be here, Adrian. Yeah, thanks for being here, taking these, uh, typically most folks have their Mondays off in church worlds, because Sunday's a big busy day, so uh, we, we get to be here, and we're excited to be live streaming. Today is, of course, our famed apologetics monday so today we're going to be talking about a a kind of a philosophical concept called hedonism um so we're going to break that down or i should say sean's going to break that down and then i'm going to try to poke holes at it but uh, anyhow we're we're excited to have apologetics mondays again if you're uh new to apologetics mondays we do take questions but we want to take questions pertaining to the subject matter that we're discussing today any other day you can ask any question you want as long as it's pertaining to the Christian faith and world religions or worldviews or or subjects that pertain to Christianity. For example, how to apply the Bible to your life, how to interpret a specific passage of Scripture, and and so on. So we encourage you to join us. For those of you who are new, this is A Reason for Hope. This is a weekday Bible answer program where we take questions from you, our live stream audience, as I said, about the Christian faith. So anything you want to ask, it's an off-the-cuff program. And we take questions from our live stream audience. We monitor our different social media platforms that we live stream to. We monitor the comment section. You use that comment section to ask your questions. Again, if you have a question that's sincere and from the heart and about the Christian faith, then we would love to hear from you and we would love to engage with you. So there's multiple ways you can do that. You can join us on YouTube. Go to YouTube.com. Of course, uh, look for A Reason for Hope, or you can go straight to our channel. Our channel is at a reason the number four hope you can also catch us on facebook search for ccf tucson or i should say you can type in the url facebook.com forward slash ccf tucson or you can search for calvary christian fellowship and you can check us out there we also live stream all of our services wednesday evening we are going through the song of solomon and sunday mornings we are going through we're getting close to the end of the book of acts so if you uh, want to go through that study you can do so we are a church that teaches through the bible book by book chapter by chapter, verse by verse. So when we say we're going through the book of Acts, we are literally going verse by verse through the book of Acts. So it's, it's a really exciting way to go through the Bible because you can not necessarily exhaust a topic, but understand who the author is and what they're trying to say in the context of the entire letter, book, or uh, moment in history. So I really encourage you to check that out. We have a whole archive of of books that we've taught through over the years that you can check out at our website, calvarychristianfellowship.com. encourage you to check that out. Now, if you uh, back to the live stream, we're also now live streaming to the X platform. So if you go to twitter.com or x.com and follow our senior pastor, Scott Richards, you can engage uh, with uh, us through that platform. So again, twitter.com and the handle is scottr4h. So just follow Pastor Scott. You can either DM or tweet and tag, and uh, we'll get the question that way. If you're watching the live stream from a Android device, unfortunately, when you, if you're following Pastor Scott, our live stream will show up on the right-hand side as a notification, and you can join. It works on a computer, works on a Mac, iPhone devices, and so on, but for some reason, in an Android device, you will not be able to comment. It's just something that Twitter <laughs> has not fixed yet. Uh, their whole live streaming system is relatively new and still a lot of bugs being worked out. But uh, it's growing. It's, uh, its live stream capabilities are getting better. So if you're joining us on Twitter, then just uh, send a direct message. Again, today's topic is hedonism. If you have a question as Sean begins to break that down, if you think of something, uh, tweet it out. Ask the question on Facebook, on YouTube. We'll get to the question, we'll answer it, and uh, if we miss a question, we'll obviously get to it later on in the week, because we do this every weekday, Monday through Friday, 4 to 5 p.m. Now, if you are one of those folks who does not want to be on social media, do not want to ask questions or participate on social media, I have a few friends like that, (laughs) you can just go to our website, calvarychristianfellowship.com, join the live stream by hitting the Watch Live tab, and you will have a little comment box. It's not a social media platform. Uh, You can create a pseudo Username, if you want to make a comment or ask a question, there's a little comment box there, and you can do it that way as well. Now, if you also want to ask a question more discreetly, you can just email us directly. And our email address here on A Reason for Hope is questions at a reason for hope.org. That's questions at a reason the number four 
hope.org. That being said, we're going to take a moment to pray before we let Sean kind of break down the subject of hedonism. Sean, would you care? I'd be happy to. Dad, thank you that we have the chance to be here. Please fill me and Adrian with your spirit and allow the people listening to be ministered to, whether on the outside looking in from the Christian worldview or those who have embraced you. Allow your spirit to give them ears to hear and us mouths to speak your heart clearly, free from error, and in a way where this is applied to our daily lives as we are not only more thankful to you, but also more honest with ourselves about the things we look to in order to meet the need you designed us for. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That is true. So hedonism, what is that word mean? <laughs> it's a big one. Got a lot of material to cover, so obviously I'm going to be sticking to the notes as much as possible. But in light of the fact that at the time of this recording, it is the month of June, a uh, lot of retail companies and social media platforms also refer mm. to it as Pride Month. And uh, of course, Babylon Bee and others have referred to it as Dinosaur Month, which I'm more in favor of. We're obviously caught in the middle of all of the shenaniganry of pandering to groups that aren't necessarily in cohesion with each other, but for some reason are upholding common values. So obviously if we were to just put LGBT on the cover, that'd get a lot of negative attention, but it wouldn't actually get to the heart of the issue that puts a distance between us and them as far as a Christian worldview and the LGBT worldview. The LGBT worldview, for the most part, is based around a principle known as hedonism, whereas we would use God's nature to determine right and wrong. There's like Jesus and there's not that. The hedonist worldview stems largely from the view of pain and pleasure, that this makes me feel good or this doesn't make me feel good, this doesn't make me feel accepted, this doesn't make me feel happy, therefore it's the wrong thing to do. Or you are in the wrong because you are causing bad feelings to take place. And in order to understand this, I want to, again, use their terms as much as possible, as well as their arguments. And in this vi this video, we're going to, with the time that's allotted to us, essentially break this down into three categories. Again, this is a Christian speaking to fellow Christians. First, we're going to understand a little bit of the history behind this thought process, where this worldview ultimately stems from in the Pride Month mentality, and why their word choice is actually more accurate than they probably intended to. The second is addressing what are called clobber passages, their term, not ours, where Obviously, the stigma that's put against the Bible and being anti-gay propaganda and so forth, being able to go to the passages that they would demonize, understand them in their proper context, not so that you would necessarily use these arguments with them, but so that when they're put forward and saying, you know, the Bible says to exterminate such and such and this and that, well, you can know the right answer, know the issues that are argued by their best and brightest. We'll be citing people like Matthew Vines, Brandon Robertson, and others, but ultimately then providing a counter perspective so that in your own thoughts, in your own words, in your own arguments and conversations, we are ultimately better at communicating rather than just engaging in a debate that muddles down to just two dogs butting heads with each other. And then lastly, how to witness to hedonists, people who are coming from this worldview, heterosexual or homosexual. They're ultimately viewing the world from a lens that is contrary to the gospel and can even be found among Christian circles. So we will start with the history. So there you have it. We're going to talk about hedonism from those different perspectives. Again, this is Apologetics Monday, so if you do have a question, I'll be checking those out. All right. So starting with the history, uh, the most recent, I should say most popular uh, voice of authority on what we are dealing with now today was due to the academic and psychological research of a man by the name of John Money. Uh, if you want to look up his main source, you can look up the Reimer twins experiment, uh, R-E-I-M-E-R, where, of course, uh, twin brothers were born to a family, but due to a botched circumcision, one of the brothers was rendered without a functioning uh, apparatus for his male parts, and so they took advantage of this as an opportunity to perform a test as to whether or not nature or nurture determine gender identity. And with the advent of things like matriarchism or feminism, it was important for people to have supporting evidence to these assumptions, that there is no masculine or feminine in roles in society. Society just determines what those things mean and are. And so the more evidence they had, the better. 
they gave this guy full free reign, which ultimately ended up in a prolonged attempt to molest and abuse the children, uh, force them into positions that were not appropriate for children of their age, and in order to constantly badger them and immerse them in things that would be considered feminine and masculine based on which role was assigned to them. Bruce was the unfortunate individual who was assigned the female role, and he now today has gone back to the original birth name of David, is happily married to a woman with children and, of course, is not a fan of the conclusions that weren't actually come to or weren't actually arrived at as a result of his research and his molestation of them. But despite the fact that all of the study was literally just a bizarre uh, exploration of this sadistic scientist fetishes and wanting to control these young men, it was put forward in psychological journals and is essentially the foundation of gender theory as we know it today in order to uphold the idea that it's nature versus nurture, it's all in nurture. And that argument, of course, is a failed experiment, but it's treated as the foundation of society, which I think is ironic because as we're discussing Pride Month, and we'll define our terms with that in a moment, it's not true but we treat it as if it is. It's a comfortable lie. Keep that in mind because understand this isn't anything new. We could, uh, and Peter Martin and I have talked about this uh, many studios ago when we were discussing the trend of these things and he's mentioned others, but I wanna go back to around the time of, actually before the time of Christ, before the t- after the time of Alexander the Great as well, where a man by the name of Epicurus, who actually founded the term of hedonism, Epicureanism as it's also called, his main document is called Principal Doctrines and to his credit, he does make some accurate observations that would line up with biblical principles. Uh, this is a quote from Epicurus, uh, he who is not satisfied with a little will be satisfied by nothing. That, that is accurate. Delayed gratification is a good thing. But ultimately, where he came from served as the foundation for a lot of atheistic philosophy, because he put it most eloquently. He wasn't the first to do it by any means, but the most eloquent documented reference to this life is all there is. When you die, you're done. We only experience things in this life. Therefore, it's the only life that matters. While he was coming from a pagan background, he made the perspective popular among his groups, and Paul even debated with them in Acts 17, centered around the idea that the gods are there, but they're not involved with us, so they may as well not be. It served as kind of a proto-atheism. But what's interesting about Epicurus's philosophy is that, once again, it determines right or wrong on this basis of pain is uh, wrong, pleasure is good. If it makes me feel good, then it is good. It can't be wrong because it feels so right. That's the principle of hedonism. Now, generally, when we look at hedonists, we tend to think, oh, so the party animal, to live like a Corinthian, as it was oftentimes referred to. And while that is true in some sense, if you're consistent with the worldview, why not have pleasure is good, why not the most possible pleasure, in spite of the consequences and hangovers it may have later? Most people who embrace a hedonist worldview don't live consistently with that, and so, as is the writings and observations of Epicurus, he did, in fact, regard there is a benefit to delayed gratification. But it all stems from a worldview of saying that, I like it, therefore, this is what's right for me. Remember that phrase. I and my sensation, my um, perception, my ideal and paragon of what my life ought to be is ultimately the best life because who else is there to determine what's right for me? Because who else is feeling things apart from me? My perception, my sensation, that's the foundation of ethics. Now again, you can look up the nuances of this in principal doctrines, but I won't accuse Epicurus of adopting, again, this concept of pride and a self-centered worldview, and I don't mean that as derogatory, it's just descriptive. But when we go back to before the heavens and earth were made, this mindset and idea of pride as the foundation of one's character, culture, and worldview actually stems from an interesting individual. We refer to him as Satan or the adversary. Uh, You can call him Lucifer if you like, but the point being made is, whereas John Money's argument was nature versus nurture in my identity, Epicurus was arguing pain versus pleasure in terms of morality, 
Lucifer was the first to make an argument of God versus self as the foundation of who I am, of what I am. And, of course, if you want to read more on the ins and outs of that, read Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. We'd be happy to address it later in the week or on future broadcasts, but the ultimate stem from his perspective is centered around this concept that this month apparently is celebrating, and that is pride. Now, pride, for those of you who hear that a lot in Christian circles but haven't really been given a sound definition, I'll give another example here in a moment, but as far as how we're using it here today, the term in its simplest form is a self-deception worldview. It's a false view of yourself and others. Now, how this is expressed, how this is lived out practically, I think was very eloquently stated in chapter 8 of C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. We're discussing the topic of pride. He went into great detail. Uh, I'll be reading a good section, about three paragraphs, so I want you to follow along with me. But note that as we're going to be applying this principle of pride as a negative versus a positive, the worldview of the hedonist community is stemming from this attitude its foundation, whether they're aware of it or not. So notice how he describes, illustrates, and then ultimately applies it. According to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil, is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Does this seem to you exaggerated? If so, think it over. I pointed out a moment ago that the more pride one had, the more one disliked pride in others. In fact, if you want to find out how proud you are, the easiest way is to ask yourself, how much do I dislike it when other people snub me, or refuse to take any notice of me, or shove their oar in, or patronize me, or show off? The point is that each person's pride is in complete, uh, competition excuse me, with everyone else's pride. It is because I wanted to be the big noise at the party that I am so annoyed at someone else being the big noise. Two of a trade never agree. Now what you want to get clear it in that pride is essentially competitive is competitive by its very nature, while other vices are competitive only, so to speak, by accident. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good-looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer, cleverer, or better-looking than others. If someone else became equally rich or clever or good-looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. Once the element of competition is gone, pride is gone. That is why I say that pride is essentially competitive in a way the other vices are not. The sexual impulse may drive two men in competition if they both want the same girl, but that is only by accident. They might just as likely may have wanted two different girls. But a proud man will take your girl from you, not because he wants her, but just to prove to himself he's a better man than you. Greed may drive men into competition if there is not enough to go around, but the proud man, even when he has got more than he could possibly want, will still try to assert his power. Nearly all those evils in the world which people put down to greed or selfishness are really far more the result of pride. He gives an example with money, but note the point that he's making. The power is what pride really enjoys. There is nothing that makes a man feel superior to others as being able to move them about like toy soldiers. What makes a pretty girl spread misery wherever she goes by collecting admirers? Certainly not for her sexual instinct. That kind of girl is quite often sexually frigid. It is pride. What is it that makes a political leader or a whole nation go on and on, demanding more and more? Pride again. Pride is competitive by its very nature, and that is why it goes on and on. If I am a proud man, then as long as there is one man in the whole world more powerful or richer or cleverer than I, he is my rival and am my enemy. The Christians are right. It is pride which has become the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. Other vices may sometimes bring people together. You may find good fellowship and joke and friendliness among drunken people or unchaste people, but pride always means enmity. It is enmity, and not only enmity between man and man, but enmity to God. 
So here's the point that he's making in all of this. When we're talking about the fundamental conflict between God and man, we're seeing that it's either he's in control or I am in control. And this perspective and worldview that is in fundamental conflict with the nature and role God desires to have in each of our lives is ultimately going to be lost if we don't first acknowledge the aspect of our fallen sinful nature that can't, not won't, but can't trust because it is in fundamental conflict by definition with who God created us to be and who God is by nature. So when we see a world shaking its fist at God, obviously there are a number of ways that people can do that. C.S. Lewis gave many examples, whether it's through money, whether it's through power, whether it's through sex, whether it's through whatever. In the hedonist movement, in the pride movement, not the act of sex in and of itself is what they have dominated, but equating the term identity, my pleasure, my pursuit of happiness, as the ultimate good, regardless of what's said against it. And that kind of competition does not have an off switch, and it certainly is not going to find harmony, even amongst its own groups. If you ask a homosexual man what his thoughts are of women on principle, since his determination and factor of what is ultimately good in life is his relationship to other men, you find that they don't have fond feelings of women on principle. Not, of course, individuals, but just as a rule. Their happiness, their foundation, source, and motivation in life is based on what? Relationships. No interest in relationships, no interest in women, because my image is my mirror image, what I'm drawn to, what feels right to me. Likewise, lesbians, no love for gay men. Gay men and lesbians have no love for trans people, and all of their approaches are mutually indistinguishable or uh, mutually exclusive to one another, yet they don't make a distinguishment between each other and have now even incorporated Islam into their mix due to their attraction to children. Why? Not because of a shared perspective or admiration of each other, but a foundation and worldview that is in opposition to any authority apart from their own culture. Now, with that culture then in mind, where is this hostility, where is this enmity expressed ultimately against the Bible? For Muslims, obviously, we'll have our own session on that, and it's ultimately going to be interesting to see what the Muslim hedonist alliance is going to be. I believe last Saturday, uh, Palestinian protesters uh, got it violent with a pride parade, and I attempted not to be amused by the irony in why they didn't expect anything less. But yeah, the, in Philadelphia, they, they confronted them, and... Uh, well, I don't know if there was violence, but they definitely oh, clashed. <laughs> yeah, and uh, again, they call that in Germany Thursdays. But the point being made is this. Moving on from the history, the perspective behind this, the term is hopefully consistent. We're talking about a fundamental, a self-deceptive view of others and yourself. And if it's ultimately coming from my view of relationships, my view of feelings, my view of my place in society, then anything that stands against that, anything that doesn't make me feel good, is ultimately going to be the enemy. And when the Bible makes opposition, say for example, or exception to their choice of lifestyles, particularly in homosexual circles, there are one of two approaches, either to throw the Bible out or try to coerce and convert the Bible into their way of thinking. And this is why worldviews matter, because when ultimately your culture, your society, even your own desires, your pride, has an authority and influence over your handling of Scripture, then if every radio station had this broadcast playing, it wouldn't do them any good because it's not based on any authority over themselves. My pride, my self-image, my self-aggrandizement, my ultimate authority, I will be as God, knowing good and evil. And that's why the first and ultimate interaction of Satan in sharing his character with us was the challenge, has God indeed said? So moving on from history and understanding our definition in terms, notice how this affects their handling of the Bible. And when you are talking to people who are in this lifestyle, understand that these are the passages that are going to be brought up as an obstacle, as a smokescreen that need to be dealt with effectively in order to understand this. There are more, but I've chosen three from the old and three from the new 
and allowing for their own representatives to speak on their behalf. Uh, this will be citing from the research of Matthew Vines, Brandon Robertson, and other scholars who call themselves Christians, believe it or not, yet redefine the Bible in the image of hedonism. The first, and probably the one you're most familiar with, is Genesis chapter 19 and verses 4 through 7. I'll read it plainly. Now, before they lay down, that were the angels that visited Lot, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all people from every quarter, surrounded the house, and they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind them, or behind him, and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. Now, this is what they would consider a clobber passage because it presents the homosexual lifestyle in a negative light. Lot calls their actions wicked. But don't let that stop you. Brandon Robertson to the rescue. Uh, he would note that, and this is in his uh, argument from the article on Phileo, the act of homosexuality isn't explicitly condemned in the passage. And later passages only mention their pride and inhospitality as the reason why God judged them. They would note Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50, and Jeremiah 13, 14 as examples of this. The wickedness being mentioned was the fact it was non-consensual relations, not the homosexual aspect in of itself. So there you have it. They would give other verse citations to provide further context. They would note the condemnation of Sodom was listed in other later passages, and that seems like a sound handling of Scripture to someone who maybe isn't willing to look those things up. But when you look at Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 16, for instance, what do the passages actually say? Well, it condemns Samaria, the northern ten tribes of Israel, and Judah, the southern two tribes of Israel, for having things in common with Sodom. And here's where the manipulation of the text lies. Both, and this is key, both of those passages, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, make comparisons to Sodom as wicked, but not exhaustively. But before we even go there, the act of homosexuality is explicitly condemned in the passage in the immediate next verse, Notice this. What's the dismissal? What's the argument? The issue wasn't being homosexual. The issue was non-consensual. What happened in verse, tw uh, verse 8 of Genesis 19? Lot offers his two virgin daughters as a offering to the men of the city in exchange for the men because he wanted to be hospitable. That wouldn't be consensual, now would it? Now you say, oh, well, you know, underage, you know, if the parents consent and stuff, go the Daniel Hatikachu route. That's their arguments now. You can just throw up and walk away. But the principle is what? Where's the manipulation? Don't read more passages. I'm going to set terms for it that aren't actually in the text to make the text appear not to say what it's plainly saying. But let's again go to the other verse responses to give it for, uh, uh, more context. When the argument is that Sodom's exclusive sins, and we've talked about this in Bible contradiction accusations as well, are listing Sodom's actions as exhaustively adulterous, inhospitable, liars, and so forth. When you make a comparison, what is your standard for the quote-unquote explicit condemnation argument? The burden of actual proof is on the individual who makes the claim, and the one making the claim is the hedonist to demonstrate from the text that lies, adultery, and inhospitality are the only things wrong with Sodom, and the reason those things were brought up. Because note, if you read the passages, the reason they were brought up is because Judah and Samaria had those things in common. And unless you want to argue, and this is the point, that no comparison between two topics is possible, unless they have 100% agreement on all of their defects, then at the same time also argue that direct statements should be reinterpreted in light of entirely different context, I'd simply accuse people like Matthew Vines and Brandon Robertson as deceptive and, this is key, the people who quote them as being misled. You need to catch how they're jumping between two definitions. Only in hospitality, lies, and adultery were, were condemned in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Jeremiah and Ezekiel point these things out because Judah and Samaria had that in common. 
What's the leap? What's the assumption? That these were the only things wrong with Sodom ever. And there's others who can go to Luke 10 and note that unbelief was something also wrong, according to Jesus. Believers, <laughs> unbelievers, what's the emphasis and point of Genesis 19? It's look over here, don't look behind the curtain. The second clobber passage is one that's probably the most direct, Leviticus 18.22, you shall not lie with a man as with a woman, it is an abomination. Now, Brandon Robertson's approach towards this is a qualifier that Leviticus 18 actually starts in verse 3 by saying not to do all the things that are being mentioned, whether it's referring to incest, adultery, etc., the way that the nations around them committed. Homosexuality isn't being condemned as a rule, but the ritualistic and pagan way it was approached by the nations. So the issue isn't same-sex attraction or even activity. The issue is having a pagan twist on it. And you're going to see this is basically the hermeneutic going forward of saying, don't look at what's obviously being said. Here's the point, though. When we're noting the Old Testament law, and this is important in general principle, we're not being dictated what every Christian is supposed to enforce because that was specifically given to the nation of Israel on how they were to govern their laws as much socially as morally and legislatively. But this is a law based on the perspective of God and something that he saw and bore witness to, as with the rest of the clobber passages, throughout Scripture, throughout history. So this revelation of God's character doesn't tell us that we're to go out and stone uh, homosexuals, but it is telling us how God views these things and how a legislation based on his nature would ultimately treat that. So here's the point. When people like Brandon Robertson are going to say that, well, this isn't say, saying homosexuality on principle, it's just saying that this is referring to uh, ritualistic and pagan homosexual acts and rituals. Okay, but here's the problem. If the argument is that there's a context in which homosexual relationships, specifically in the sense laid throughout chapter 18 of Leviticus as sex, then the burden of proof is once again not to dismiss the passage as not meaning what it says, but to provide one, just one, example of a positive homosexual relationship in the sense that Matthew Vines and Brandon Robertson are pulling out of thin air. Now, again, being through this ball game many times, having played many seasons in these kind of conversations, they'd say, well, it says there in 1 Samuel that Jonathan and David loved each other better than the love of women. How can you say that that's not a sexual relationship? Um, Adrian, I, I have a confession to make to you here. We're bros. We're buddies. We're friends. In fact, as a happily single man, I would probably enjoy spending more time with you watching uh, Godzilla and Star Wars flicks than I would having to pay off bills and uh, cater to the emotional needs of the fairer sex. We're not gay. There is another kind of relationship that can involve and be superior to physical attraction. But the hedonist worldview, once again, is either going to dictate to them that there is no such thing, that that's the only thing that any relationship could involve or include, which is sad, or they're just being deceptive. Both are possible. But here's the point. If they would go to other examples, like, well, it says in the Gospels that the disciples were laying on the bosom of Jesus. How do you say that Jesus' disciples weren't gay with each other? I mean, look at Dan Brown, the Da Vinci Code, right? I think that bears without saying, but because we're trying to be exhaustive in our addresses here, Dan Brown was a liar and a historical revisionist. Secondly, sitting next to someone, sitting on the, at their side, literally, is what the translation says, doesn't make someone gay. Otherwise, we're going to have to really consider layouts for restaurants if nothing wants to be misunderstood. Here's the whole point that's being made, though. If there's a sense in which you have positive, monogamous, holy, and sanctified homosexual relationships, you have to provide that, not twist passages in order to make loving relationships automatically meaning their sexual relationships. That would be what we call eisegesis. So understand, the act of laying with a man as a woman mentioned, and only the act of a man laying with a man as with a woman is described. And hiding behind terms like uh, to uh, toba, uh, the term for abomination, 
as being, and this is his hand-waving gesture, um, being referred to as ceremonially unclean but not objectively wrong is actually missing the point of communication as much as it is assuming this could only be referring to slaves or non-consensual uh, encounters. We can look up, for example, the words used throughout the Proverbs and the Prophets, but if history doesn't suffice, then translating something as disgusting isn't a rational reason to say, for instance, God said gross, but he didn't say wrong. <laughs> If you see the historical example of Sodom and what we're about to cover in the land of Benjamin, when someone brings this kind of argument up, it's once again, they're lying or they've been lied to. And there are two ways to deal with them. We'll get to that in our third point. The third example of a clobber passage would be in Judges 19, verse 22 through 23, uh, speaking of a priest who brought him and his concubine, first issue, uh, to a man's house and to be shown hospitality. It says, as they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city, perverted men, surrounded the house and beat on the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, bring out the man who came to your house that we may know him carnally. Sound familiar? But the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, No, my brethren, I beg you, do not act so wickedly. Seeing this man has come into my house, do not commit this outrage. Uh, the hedonist objection, much like the prior one, is the problem was a lack of consent, the same as Genesis. The response to that is, the problem wasn't consent. The next verse includes the priest, who was their target, offering his concubine instead, and the men raping her to death. The same as Genesis. The historical example is the act of homosexuality being condemned. The historical trend of drawing attention away from the act that is called wicked in another aspect of the encounter was also, and is, uh, that was also wicked, doesn't take away from the fact that something wicked has taken place. Here's my point. When Brandon Robertson is saying it wasn't homosexuality that was the issue, it was the lack of consent that made it wicked. Well, that would be like saying, look at the other evil thing they were doing. That doesn't undermine the first and plain evil they were also doing. For example, robbery isn't justified because the robbers also committed assault. Unless you're Alvin Bragg, but that's another issue. So here's the point. Hand-waving, red herring, gesture, look at this. Taking away from the obvious statement that every single historical example of a relationship in the homosexual context is not only portrayed negatively, but also the complete absence of any positive one, which is what would be required if you were to put forward there's another sense in which these relationships could be engaged in. And when you say, well, they didn't know, they couldn't know anything like the relationships we have today, where you have committed monogamous same-sex relationships that are holy instead of side to God. Well, let's go into the New Testament and take which, what time we have left to ask and clarify if the principles, rather than the historical examples, are also providing a consistent picture of this being a bad thing, or if, of course, Brandon Robertson's approach is just bad handling of Scripture. The book of Romans, chapter 1 and verse 26, Paul speaking, for this reason, refer referencing uh, not entertaining God in their knowledge, but suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, what context is this, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Now, uh, just as a side note, this is the first and most direct and explicit condemnation of the Bible of lesbianism. So if someone's going to say, well, it condemns men and men, but not women and women, sorry. But the hedonist is going to say, well, Roman culture included things like idol worship, pederasty, which is child sex slaves, and other things that he's actually condemning, not monogamous, consensual, same-sex relationships. The response that we'd have to that is that, first of all, idol worship is condemned separately from this verse two verses prior. Trying to distance the audience from the obvious point and providing additional context where none is actually warranted shows there is an agenda dictating their handling of the text rather than just plainly reading it. We want to give a mind for an agenda that's ultimately at work here, but also for the historical context. But what we need 
within the passage or that's being clarified in other scripture is an actual example of what he's proposing is the exception. So understand that. Arguing from silence or assuming the Bible never addresses the subject the way we're doing it now is missing the whole point of communication and language. Everyone can come up with a bizarre exception to everything. If they qualify, it was never condemned with the explicit qualifiers they put on it when the entire category has already been condemned. That's the error here. There's another issue, too, that uh, women didn't engage in pederasty. No. So why would he include... Uh, female relationships if he's directly addressing uh, temple a- a- abuse of children or probably because uh, he's just addressing because in Roman <laughs> it was a little bit frowned upon in Roman culture but in Greek culture it was very well accepted for older men to have sexual relations with younger boys especially and, and of course they're they're servants and slaves male and female yeah, and uh, uh, the only thing that was shameful is if if a man took the uh, passive position rather than the aggressive position, and that would be considered you know taboo. Yeah, there but, was a slur form called malikos. But to include women in this text excludes the idea of pederasty, yeah. because women did not engage in pederasty. It's not; it wasn't part of the culture, because and if it they could. It wasn't <laughs> Paul's point, <laughs> right? Yeah. But the point is, the plain sense makes sense, therefore, why are you seeking another sense? You're putting forward nonsense. Uh, But with that then said, and moving on from Romans, Paul also speaking in 1 Corinthians, that was to a culture that had the temple of Aphrodite that literally built its economy on child prostitution, said in chapter 6 and verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. So he's going to list off examples of unrighteous. Neither fornicators, sex outside of marriage, idolaters, basic principle other than God, adulterers, sex within marriage but not with your committed partner, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, Now, note the potential redundancy in that. This is what they're going to jump on. Nor thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. This is where they'll hopefully stop, but will continue. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So just as a quick aside, if you think that someone in a homosexual lifestyle or caught up in the cult of hedonism can't be saved, Bible disagrees with you. But we're not here to address the bad ideas of well-meaning but ultimately misled Christians. We're here to deal with false teachers, of which they would say, Paul's word in referencing homosexuals is arsenicoite, which literally translates as man-bed. And it was it, a made-up word, too. <laughs> yeah, well, it was describing something, but it didn't exist in the lexicons and Uh, in the Greek language. And since no official definition exists, you can't explicitly conclude it's referring to homosexuality on principle, but the abuse of slaves and pederasty. Our response is, of course, pretending no official definition exists. When Paul's dictionary was the Old Testament, Mm -hmm. shows the real goal in reading these passages from the activists. They don't want to understand what's being communicated. They want to prevent communication from being possible and put themselves as an authority over Scripture based on their cultures and desires rather than the actual text. Yeah, Because Paul Paul was a Pharisee, right? Yeah, he took, he took, he was a, he read the Old Testament in the Septuagint in Greek. Mm -hmm. He took Old Testament words, put them together to communicate precisely what he wanted to communicate. He could have chosen many terms from the Greek language that would have communicated the kinds of relationships that others have said was common in Greek culture and Roman culture. They would have been things like pederasty and so on. And he uses the term malikos in referring to effeminate or sodomites. Yeah, so he takes an old, the Old Testament Greek version to communicate precisely that the act itself is what's, uh, what's at stake here, not any kind of relationship, but the act itself. Man, bed. <laughs> With, of course, Leviticus 18.22 in yeah. mind. But that's the whole issue. If Leviticus 18 doesn't count as what he had in mind when, of course, discussing this passage, then interpretation of Scripture is now impossible until 
God graced us with people like Brandon Robertson to lead us into the true meaning of the human language. Not wanting to acknowledge the obvious as a hallmark sign of why they're ignoring verse 11, you are washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, as much as verse 9. They don't want forgiveness and restoration, which is the real sin that can't be forgiven. And that's the issue. Mm. Uh, the last one, and then we'll get into how to witness, is 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless, the insubordinate, for ungodly, and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, manslayers, fornicators, sodomites, kidnappers, liars, perjurers, if there's any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine. Now, you probably can already guess what methodology is going to say. The sodomite is misunderstood as homosexual. It's actually referring to malikos, which is the receiving end of the child sex slave. The response is, once again, that's just a lie. In his article, he said, well, malikos isn't here. Look up the lexicon. It's arsenicoites again. Lying about the original language is an insight. But with all this being said, what would be the actual argument? What would be the actual issue? Don't pay attention to the obvious. I'm going to make up this exception with a modern lens and say that this is something God approves of when I can't provide a definition within text, no historical example, no doctrinal example, just exceptions to obvious rules. But with twisting of Scripture in mind and showing that there is an actual desire to twist the text rather than present it, why would we expect anything different? Their worldview is what feels right to me, not what is true based on God's nature, even at the expense of my own. I don't blame them for that. But the question then is, if this is a roadblock between us and ultimately where someone's going to be between receiving the gospel or not, any area of sin that's dominated someone's life and mind to the point where they'll only see the world through and any attempt at rationality on a position is going to dismiss it on principle, that's going to accomplish nothing. But this is military tactics 101. What do you do when you're facing an enemy in an entrenched position with superior numbers? You don't make a forward assault, you go around, (laughs) you get them to disperse. You do anything but the straightforward and obvious approach. Mm. So if you think, how do I reason with these people if they're just going to redefine everything that I say? Well, the answer is take an indirect approach, not a direct one. So with the remainder of the time we have in the broadcast, and this is based on experience, three things that have not only allowed me to have people like Madeline, like Connie, like Will, like Nate, like others who come from this background but still remember and recognize that I care about them, mm-hmm. that I love them. Just a reminder, too, for those of you who have been asking questions, if it's not pertaining to the subject of hedonism, uh, save your questions for tomorrow. We'll get back to the normal uh, program Tuesdays through Fridays, but today's uh, Apologetics Mondays. Hope you've enjoyed the program so far. Uh, Sean, can you uh, continue, please? All right. Um, But just note the basic tactics. There's going to be three things that I want to discuss that, again, time and tested. This won't be like an immediate how to win the debate with them, but these Mm -hmm. are the kind of things you need to keep in mind when talking to people. People. I know that they will use terms where it says they don't see us as people. Here I am. I disagree with you. I still care about you. And you've been presenting this to a Christian. Like, Mm -hmm. what you've been sharing so far has been, I'm I'm instructing believers who agree with me, so you're just pouring through the information quickly. Uh, You're not sort of setting an example of, well, here's how I would say these things to someone who's coming from that uh, worldview. Uh, Now you're going to address that. (laughs) Right, and when I'm addressing, say, for example, the worldview and perspective of a guy like Brandon Robertson, I can call him a liar because I've shown where he's deliberately misrepresented the text. And And he's he's admitted as much, interestingly, a little side note, but now the the tactic is to just say, well, they were products of their time. Yes, he did say that. You're right, he did make that clear. The Bible does say that, but the Bible got it wrong. Yeah, changed that's, in t- that's three the, years. That's the month. tune now. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the whole point. We can still treat someone as a human being and, of course, disagree with them. And that's something that not only we need to remember, but that's something that actually has to be explained, M- maybe multiple times, in fact. So three things. The first is when you're talking to someone who's from a hedonist worldview, and this will be multitasking, by the way. 
If you're speaking to someone who comes from this perspective, this kind of rhetoric is going to be important when you're talking to atheists as well. First, understand the real issue here. When people turn to relationships, cultural trends, or anything else, they're doing it for a reason. That's the simplest way I can put it. It can be dealing with things like loneliness, loneliness, excuse me, and pursuing a sense of community. You see it very popular on the internet. It's an easy in. I just have to, you know, act flamboyantly or gruffly and wear some rainbow flags, sign me up. That, of course, is a possibility, not a guarantee. It can also be a distraction from stress and anxiety through the adrenaline rush these things provide. Like any other addiction, they're turning to a form of medicine, whether it's the thrill in relationships, the thrill of pursuing their unique and specific events and kinks and lifestyles. Not to be crass, but we are again talking about something that is by nature. That is a possibility. And you need to be aware that people don't turn to medication unless they're trying to medicate. They're probably in pain. That is something that needs to be considered. Or it could be fitting into the mold of psychological trauma due to abuse in their past. Many prominent activists in the homosexual and hedonist community have acknowledged that, yes, I was molested as a child and this kind of shaped my worldview, but I understand it was the right thing for me. Well, here's the point. When you're dealing with this kind of individual, when you're trying to scope the kind of person you're talking to, you see the you know, technicolor hair or flag or profile picture that includes pronouns, anything like that, the thing you don't do is profile them right away. You need to ask them questions and listen to their answers. And you can discover these things a lot faster than rhetoric or memes claiming that this is just who I am or this is how I feel or you're just trying to uh, abuse me, you're a homophobe and all that stuff. That will never lead you anywhere. The three main things, again, that you need to be able to ask leading questions towards, not as a manipulation tactic, but so that you understand the person you're talking to, is first social. They will ultimately, the reason why they're in this lifestyle, is that they look up to people in this kind of lifestyle and want to be how they portray themselves. Notice, not how they are, but how they portray themselves. I'm happy, I'm content, I just feel right. Who doesn't want that? But the problem is social media can filter out a lot as well. You need to be able to ask the kind of questions that are ultimately saying, okay, is this dealing with your need for a community? And, of course, if you're getting around that issue, you need to be able to address this from a purely practical perspective. If their examples are false, then practical, direct examples to the contrary. What about this activist who admitted later on that it wasn't satisfying? You can look up the uh, transgender faith uh, written by uh, Walt Hare, who of course talked about his embracing of this lifestyle and that it ultimately didn't matter. That will give them something to think about because that kind of approach, that kind of mindset was the same that got them into this lifestyle. They saw happy people in the hedonist community and they had something to think about. Give them more to think about if you're dealing with a social hedonist. The second is a moral hedonist that they would see our culture celebrate these lifestyles and want the majority to treat them the same way. All I have to do is put my profile pictures and you know put up the rainbow flag and suddenly I'm accepted, not abused on social media? Sign me up. The way to deal with that kind of perspective would be not practical examples because they'll they won't care about the actual practicality of this. They just want the immediate relief. What you need are intellectual challenges to the culture. This is generally the approach that is taken towards all of them, well-intended individuals, of course, online, but they're dealing with the wrong kind of person. You know, the, the circle goes in the circle, the square goes in the square, make sure that you don't get the two confused, although I am told that the square circle works for everything. The last is personal, that they have been abused or mistreated by people with values, both on, on both sides, by the way, whether someone who was heterosexual abused them and so they distanced themselves from the male or female as much as possible, or people like uh, Dr. Spock, unfortunately, Leonard Nimoy, who admitted that he was molested and, of course, that shaped his sexual worldview. That kind of person doesn't need contrary examples because they're the example. 
That person doesn't need intellectual challenges. It's an emotional and personal issue. What they need is time and comfort, and you need to be able to ask the right questions and recognize what kind of person you're dealing with. So understand, when you're talking to atheists, it's the same principle. This will, in fact, be good training for multitasking. The second issue that you need to be aware of are noticing assumptions. Not just the kind of person you're dealing with, but the way that they're speaking. You aren't obligated to play games by rules you don't agree to. And this isn't referring, again, to things like demanding you use their Thank pronouns or the like. Not one it's when they charge you with hating individuals when your disagreement is with a political movement. The fact you don't like a particular lifestyle is treated as despising a unique individual. That's not necessarily true. The reality is the political and religious group of modern hedonism has a playbook that needs to redefine every conversation they have, often multiple times in a sentence, and you need to be aware of this. This is why being polite and gentle ultimately amounts to nothing if the words you're saying have different meanings. Things to watch out for would be things like person and idea being the same thing. If I challenge your idea, that means I'm attacking the person clarify that's not true morality equals feelings you're saying that's wrong you're hurting me no i'm saying that's wrong whether it hurts you or not you need to understand that tolerance means agreement once again you need to clarify that definition and lastly that love means acceptance and by the way if you're dealing with mormons talking to hedonists is an excellent practice for that because they will also redefine many words that are foundational to your conversation you can seemingly have a productive conversation yet someone got upset when it seemed like you were speaking reasonably understanding their dictionary will come in handy for this and then lastly to finish up with the last minute we have treat and talk the way you'd want to be treated in an ultimate sense most people prefer to be handled gently, but can also appreciate when someone talked to them the way they needed to when they were out of line or caught up in something they later regretted. No parent is condemned ultimately for neglecting their kids because they thought discipline would hurt their feelings or mean when they weren't friends anymore. We're dealing with a group that chants and cheers in public, they're coming for your children and is so dedicated to challenging what they are taught as oppressive and evil that they'll embrace things that are so outright demonic in their nature, not just in dress, but things like Islam even, and contrary to themselves, in order for the noble intention to be achieved to be on the right side of history. So understand, I don't want to personally be rude to people unless I know that they're lying to me. Then I would be more direct. But if you keep reminding yourself this person is deceived rather than deceiving you, give them the benefit of the doubt at face value, and it will be that much easier to understand when apologies are warranted for going too far and recognizing when pushing forward is necessary so that they are ultimately understanding their choices are hurting more people than they're helping, including themselves. Well, thanks, Sean, and thanks for tuning in today. For those of you who've been watching, we got cut out. We're having some technical issues here in the studio. We'll hopefully be resolved this week, but uh, we'll see you again tomorrow. God bless you. You've been listening to A Reason for Hope. Thank you again for joining us as we continue our journey through God's Word, one question of the heart at a time. Until we meet again, we would love to connect with you. You can text or email your questions to questionsforhope at gmail.com. You can also find out more about our ministry at calvarychristianfellowship.com. And be sure to join us next time on A Reason for Hope. A Reason for Hope is an outreach ministry of Calvary Christian Fellowship in Tucson, Arizona.